his holy name. John chapter number 1. We'll begin reading in verse number 1. The Bible says, In the beginning was the Word. And if you've got the right Bible, Word is capitalized. And it's talking about the Lord Jesus himself. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. The same was in the beginning with God. All things were made by him, and without him was not anything made that was made. In him was life, and the life was the light of men. And the light shineth in darkness, and the darkness comprehended it not. Let's pray. Father, we bless you. We thank you for the good singing. Lord, we thank you for the good testimony. Lord, we thank you that you're a good God. Lord, we're thankful you're faithful and true. You are our rock, our high tower. You are our inspiration and our hope. And Lord, without you, we'd be in a mess like this whole wicked world. Now, Father, I thank you we can come to this oasis, this refuge in this old world, the house of God. Lord, for a few minutes, get our minds on heavenly things. Lord, we can focus our hearts and our attention on things that are above. And Lord, we thank you, Lord, for these thy people. We realize and understand that many of them have labored hard this week and worked hard even today. Lord, they may be tired in body, but Lord, I pray you'd refresh them and help them from the precious truths of the Word of God. Lord, I pray that, Lord, you'd meet every need of every heart. You alone, the omnipotent, omniscient God, you know our down-sitting and our uprising. You know what we stand in need of today. You know what we stand in need of tomorrow. Lord, I pray that you'd speak to our hearts, and may we not be hearers of the Word of God only, but may we receive it with gladness, and may it uh, transform us into thy likeness. Now, Father, we pray for Miss Kathy, that, Lord, you'd touch her and help her as she's recovering. Lord, we thank you for her. We pray for Brother Greg and Victory Baptist Church, that, Lord, you'd touch them and help them. You know what they stand in need of. Lord, we pray for those uh, two co-workers of Brother Jordan, their family members, the one lady that's having a complicated pregnancy. We pray you'd intervene and touch mama and baby. The other lady's sister, whatever her need is, that you'd move on it. And Father, I pray for those of our church that are sick and those that are providentially hindered and couldn't be here tonight. God, you'd bless them and help them. Now, Father, for the next few minutes, I pray you'd continue to arrange the atmosphere for worship. Use this unworthy vessel. Speak to our hearts and glorify your namesake. Father, we'll thank you for it. We'll bless you and praise you. Have your will and way now, for it's in the wonderful and holy and lovely name of the Lord Jesus we ask these things. Amen. Amen. I'd like to draw your attention to a few things from this chapter. We find that John was inspired to write some things that will reveal some things uh, about the Lord Jesus. Uh, can I say, first of all, we find that Jesus is the ceaseless God. Uh, in verse number 1, it says, In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God, and the same was in the beginning with God. Uh, there are a lot of people who believe Jesus only stepped on the scene some 2,000 years ago uh, when he came to this earth, uh, and he lived among men. Uh, but my dear friends, uh, the Bible lets us know he was the Lamb slain before the foundation of the world. Uh, and in these verses, we find that he was in the beginning. Uh, can I say the beginning didn't start when Adam and Eve uh, uh, was formed uh, and when the world came into existence? Uh, uh, the beginning goes back to the Alpha of time. Somewhere back there, uh, long before there was ever a man, uh, long before there was ever a galaxy, uh, long before there was ever a world, uh, there is a place where the throne is in the sides of the north, uh, a place where Almighty God's abode has been uh, for all of eternity. Uh, and there you'll find Jesus Christ. Uh, he's not only in the Alpha. He said he's the Alpha and the Omega. Can I say to you, he's the beginning and the end. 
as far as time will go uh, uh, long after this world's burnt out uh, long after God has created a new heaven uh, and a new earth uh, you'll find Jesus Christ uh, he's the ceaseless one uh, he always has been uh, there's never been a time when he wasn't uh, hey he told Martha he was the resurrection and the life uh, he told John on the island of Patmos uh, I'm he that was dead uh, and I'm alive, and I'm alive forevermore. Uh, he's the ceaseless one, uh, and he's our darling Savior. I feel sorry for folks that try to make Jesus out to be a man. He put on flesh, and he became all man, but he was all God at the same time. He's the ceaseless one. Can I say something else about him? He's the creative God. He's not only the ceaseless God, he's the creative God. Look in verse number 3. All things were made by him, and without him was not anything made that was made. You say, who flung the stars out there on nothing and called them by name? Jesus. Right. Who's the one that spoke the worlds into existence? Jesus. Uh, Who's the one that took the dust and formed a, a, a man in his own likeness and then breathed into man the breath of life and man became a living soul, Jesus? Uh, who's the one that created the beast of the field, Jesus? Uh, who's the one that created the flowers and the grass uh, and all the vegetation, Jesus? Uh, who's the one that created the molecules uh, and the atoms and the protons and the neutrons, Jesus? Uh, who's the one that made carbon dioxide so we could breathe and give us oxygen, Jesus? Uh, nothing has ever been created that he didn't make it. Uh, He's not only the ceaseless God, He's the creating God. Can I say something else about Him? He's the conceptual God. Look in verse number 4. In Him was life. Isn't that what He told Martha? I'm the resurrection and the life. And the life was the light of men. He's the conceptual God. He's the one uh, that conceived life in the man. He's the one that conceived light into the world. He is life and light himself. And my dear friends, he conceived it, or he's the conceptual one that brought it forth uh, into our existence. Can I say something else about Jesus? He's the ceaseless God, the creating God, the conceptual God. Nothing's ever occurred to him. Mm -hmm. But he's also a consuming God. Look at verse number 5. And the light shineth in darkness, and the darkness comprehended it not. That word comprehended not only means didn't understand it, but it also meant that darkness couldn't consume it, couldn't overcome it. Light overcomes darkness. Now we live in a dark world. There's so much division in our country. There's so much uncertainty. There's so much darkness. Uh, there's so much bad news. Uh, 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 it amazes me that since COVID, we haven't uh, heard much about the heroin ep epidemic, uh, 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 but still uh, uh, almost 90% of all court cases in the Boone County court system deals with heroin, uh, deals with opioids, uh, deals with a drug problem. Uh, uh, the reason people are on drugs is because it's getting harder and harder to cope with life uh, uh, because all the darkness, uh, all the doom, uh, everything that's going on around us. Uh, but I've got good news, light, uh, uh, it comprehends darkness, darkness doesn't comprehend light. In other words, uh, he is a consuming God and light always dispels darkness. There's been times we've had candlelight services here. We shut out all the lights, make it as dark as we can be, and we light one candle, and from that candle light another candle, and from that candle light another candle, because we're all to be the light of the world, if you know the Lord. But just one candle lit starts dispelling darkness in this sanctuary. Uh, because light dispels darkness. That's why you and I are to shine our lights used to kids who sing that song this little light of mine I will let it shine what is the importance of that so that men might see our good works and glorify our father which is in heaven Matthew chapter 5 
But you see, the reason Satan and society attacks the church so much is they want to put our light out. As every day our light shines, it is a testimony against them. The Lord said in the last days they'd call that which is good evil and that which is evil good. Uh, isn't it amazing if you go to church and try to live right and try to do right, try to be good to your neighbors and try to be good in society, they look at you as you're some kind of criminal. But somebody with nine warrants out for their arrest can go and shoot a police officer and they make him out of him to be a hero. Uh, we're living in wicked times. Isn't it amazing? Politicians can get away with everything and there's nothing wrong with that, but you, you don't dot your eye on your taxes, you go to jail. Uh, I mean, it's crazy. But I'm glad I know the Lord. We see He's the consuming God. As a matter of fact, the writer of Hebrews says that our God is a consuming fire. But can I say something else about Jesus? He's the compassionate God. Look at verse number 4. The Bible says, And the Word, or Jesus, was made flesh and dwelt among us. And we beheld His glory. The glory is the only begotten of the Father, full of grace and truth. Jeremiah tells us that the Lord said He has loved us with an everlasting love. In chapter 3, the book of John, the most uh, popular verse in the Bible, For God so loved the world that He gave His only begotten Son, that whosoever believeth in Him should not perish but have everlasting life. Jesus showed forth His love for His creation by leaving heaven and putting on flesh, become as a man, and dwelling amongst us full of grace and truth. He's a compassionate God. Brother Donald, the reason he'll sp they'll speak to you when you only got five minutes before your, sh your shift is because he was touched by all the same points as we've been touched and all the feelings of infirmities that you have felt, he has felt. And he knows what it's like to be running here and there and getting everything done and everything and, and not having all the time you'd like to have for him. He knows your heart. He knows if you could go sit on a hill for several hours and spend you would, but you only had five minutes, so he'll load you up for five minutes because he's got five minutes. Because uh, he's a compassionate God. There are some that paint him out to be a, a sissy God. Where he's just a sissy and he has to love you. No. He was so much God that he could put on flesh and endure everything that he would endure and still love you. That, that's not a sissy. Hmm? Can I say, some paint him out to be uh, uh, so stern that all he's looking for is you to mess up so he can beat you over the head with a big stick. Mm -mm. That's not the God of the Bible. Because I got news for you, we all mess up and we mess up every day. We all come short of his glory every day. He'd have a reason, Brother Peter, to just beat us like a, like a red-headed stepchild. But he doesn't. You're not redheaded, Sammy. You're all right, okay? You're good. Huh? No, but he doesn't, he doesn't look to beat us. He looks to love on us. He looks to show us grace. He looks to show us mercy. He looks to show us compassion because he realizes that we're in this flesh, and this flesh is at enmity with God. Hmm? You see, when Adam and Eve chose to sin, that sin nature was passed upon all of us, and this flesh is rotten to the core. Mm. That's why the Bible says there's none that do it good. No, not one. Not in our flesh. My dear friends, He looks at us in compassion when we strive to live for Him in spite of being in this flesh. Mm. He's the compassionate God. But then I want you to see where I really want to get tonight. He's the God that came. Look at verse 11. He came unto his own, and his own received him not. But as many as received him, to them gave he power to become the sons of God, even to them that believe on his name. Now verse 11 deals with the fact he came to his own. God chose Israel, Jacob and his 12 children, to be his 
mm, beloved race. God chose Israel. That's the chosen people. Jesus came to the Jews. The Jews didn't receive him. He came to his own. His own received him not. But aren't you glad that he didn't go back to glory? He said, but as many as would receive him. Hallelujah. You can put your name in that category if you know him. To them gave he power to become the sons of God, even to them that believe on his name. Even though that God uh, 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 chose the Jews and the Jews are his chosen people, uh, they're the true vine of God. Uh, God grafted in a branch in the vine and made a way uh, where Gentiles could come into the family of God, uh, where Gentiles could know him in the free pardon of sins, uh, where Gentiles could actually be the joint heirs to the throne of Christ. Because he came. Now think about that. He came. He's the God that came. He left glory. Everything Brother Phil talked about that he longs to go see. Jesus left it. Now get a hold of this. Now we don't know everything that goes on in glory, but the Bible's given us enough. In Isaiah 6 we find that there are uh, uh, choice angels called seraphim that have uh, six wings. Uh, they cover their face, uh, 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 their eyes with two of their wings. Uh, uh, they cover their feet with two of their wings and they fly with the other two wings. Uh, and all they do is circle the throne of God and cry, Holy, Holy, Holy. Uh, uh, they say that He is so holy they won't even look on Him. I'm talking about angelic beings uh, that won't even look on Jesus. Uh, but they proclaim His holiness. Uh, we know that there are four and twenty elders there that fall before His throne uh, and they worship Him uh, and they praise Him. Uh, all the angelic beings in heaven and all the heavenly host, uh, all they do is sing songs of praise uh, and they rejoice at who He is uh, and how wonderful He is uh, and how majestic He is. Uh, and one day, uh, uh, Brother Phil, Brother James, he chose to get up off that throne uh, where they're proclaiming His holiness, uh, where they're worshiping Him, uh, where they're giving Him every accolade that He's so worthy of. Uh, and he said, I'm going to leave all this uh, and I'm going to go to a place uh, where they'll hate me and despise me uh, because there's a few who will trust in me. Uh, he did come. He's the God that came. This is what I want to preach on this evening. I want to preach on what did Jesus gain by coming? What did he get when he came? Now think about it. Uh, now listen, we go places, we go places in hopes to gain an experience from it. Uh, we have booked three cruises that have been canceled by COVID and Lord willing next month we're going on this cruise and hallelujah they refunded my money gave me a free cruise this is a freebie and we're going on this cruise and I hope to go on this cruise to gain some relaxation to gain some weight I'm going to hit every buffet on the cruise and to go see some islands some we've been to some we haven't uh, and to spend some great quality time with my family and enjoy it. Uh, I'm not going on this cruise uh, looking to get botulism. I'm not. Hmm. I'm not going on the cruise looking to go to the infirmary. That's the beauty of being married to a nurse. I will go well stocked to uh, uh, attack anything that might attack me. Huh? But when we go places, we go to see things we've never seen, experience things we've never experienced, eat things we've never ate, uh, and enjoy it and come back with wonderful memories. What did Jesus gain by coming here? Can I say, first of all, he gained the shame of putting on flesh. He is a holy God. Now, we let that word holy roll off our tongues, but we have no concept of what holiness is. We've never experienced it. We've never been in a perfect environment where uh, there's not only not sin, there's not even the thought of sin. You can't get out of bed without thoughts in your mind that displease God. 
We've never been in a place that was holy. He left holiness to come here. But he didn't come in his holiness. He put on the same flesh that we're made out of. Charles Spurgeon said the Lord Jesus just coming into this world wrapped in flesh and just the presence of sin all around him would be like you and I running through a briar patch uh, without any clothes on and letting all the thorns and all the thistles and all the briars uh, pricking at us as we're running through there. That's what he experienced every moment he was here. He had to gain the shame of putting on flesh. At least think about that. What could be the most degrading thing that could happen to you? Lying in your own filth? Being put in a cesspool? Think about it. The most degrading thing that could ever happen to you is nothing compared to how he degraded himself to just come here. He gained the shame of putting on flesh. Can I say this? He gained the shunning of those he loved. Said he came unto his own, and his own received him not. It had been one thing if he came, put on flesh, and everybody fell in love with him. That isn't what happened. Matter of fact, the Jews despised him so much they crucified him. Mm -mm. They shunned him for telling them the truth. Can I say the truth hurts, but the truth will also set us free. Right. But he gained the shunning of those that he loved. He left the splendors of glory to come here and be despised. He left a place where he is totally adored to every nth of the imagination to come to a land where he'd be spit upon, where he'd be stripped, where he'd be beaten beyond recognition. That's what he gained. He gained the shame of putting on flesh, the shunning of those he loved, but he also gained the suffering of how cruel and vile sin could be. The Bible says the Lord laid on him the iniquity of us all. The Bible said that uh, uh, every vile and filthy unrighteous thing he became that we might be made the righteousness of God in him. But it was one thing to be made sin for us who knew no sin. It was another thing to experience the cruelty of sin. They blasphemed him. Where they took him to the hall of praetorium, they tied him to a whipping post, and they beat him with a cat of nine tails and ripped the very flesh from his body, all the while mocking him and laughing at him. They planted a crown of thorns and placed on his head and put a robe on him and put a reed in his hand and bowed before him and mocked him. They cleared their throats and they spit upon him. They buffeted him with his fist uh, and then they blindfolded him and said, If you're God, tell us who hit you. He experienced how cruel and how vile sin could be. I was teasing Brother Clint before service, the other Brother Clint, not this Brother Clint. I was teasing him saying, Miss Nett watches this every now and then that show called Snapped. Where you stand, all you can stand, so you can't, can't stand some more, and you snap. And usually it's a woman killing her husband. And that's a real blessing knowing your wife's got them detaped for months, you know. <laughs> Only to find out that Brother Clint says Rhonda watches that same channel all the time. But you watch some of them shows and it's hard to believe how vile people can become. What causes somebody to walk into a school and start shooting children? What causes people to make homemade weapons, clubs, and then beat people's brains out of their heads? 
What causes people like Jeffrey Dahmer to want to eat people? I mean, how vile you got to be to want to eat people. I love you, Brother Clint, but I'd rather have a steak. You know what I'm saying? You just aren't that appealing. There ain't enough ketchup in the world to choke you down. Uh, you know what I'm saying? Uh, but what causes that sense of sinfulness and wickedness in a person but you understand Jesus faced all of that that's what he gained by coming to this world he gained the suffering of how cruel and vile sin could be what did he gain he gained the scars that he'll carry for all of eternity after he resurrected from the grave Thomas, who doubted, one of his disciples, uh, said, Unless I see the nail prints in his hand and thrust my hand in his side, I'll not believe he rose from the dead. And then when Jesus appeared, he looked at Thomas and said, There they are. Thomas fell before him and said, My God, my King. Uh, can I say, even after he resurrected, even in his new glorified body, he still had the scars. One songwriter said the only scars in heaven are the scars in the Savior's hands and feet. The only thing man made in heaven. He'll carry those scars for all of eternity to remind us what it costs for you and I to get to go. What he gained? He gained the scars that are scary throughout the eternity. Thought about this. What he gained? He gained the scorn of Satan while he was hanging on the cross. It was one thing for those in the crowd to mock him. For those in the crowd to say, If thou be God, come down from the cross. Uh, uh, say, it was one thing for the thieves that died with him said, Save thyself and us also. It was one thing for the crowd to mock him. But the whole time he hung there, Psalms 22 reveals unto us that the bulls of Bashan encompassed him. All the devils of hell were there, and Satan himself... You can't imagine the vile things Satan was whispering in his ear while he hung there. I've got you. I'm greater than you. You're going to die and that's it. I'm taking over. There's no telling the vile things that Satan whispered in his ear. That's what he gained by coming here. The one who had been the anointed cherub, Lucifer who got full of pride and tried to take over the throne of God, was cast out, became Satan. He's the sorry, no good devil. Jesus told us in John 8, he's the liar and the father of it. He was a murderer from the beginning. There's no telling what vile things he whispered in the darling son of God's ear while he hung on the cross. I'm talking about what he gained from coming. He gained separation from the Godhead. You and I that are Bible believers know the Trinity, the triune God. God the Father, God the Son, God the Holy Spirit. They're three in one. We can't comprehend that, how there can be three, but they're one. We, we can't understand that, but I do believe it because that's what the Bible teaches. But for the first time since that alpha of time that we talked about in the beginning, God the Father and God the Spirit now were separate from the Son. It was when Jesus was on the cross and the Lord laid on him the iniquity of it all and how vile must it be that God turned the sun out in the middle of the afternoon. Total darkness. But when Jesus became your sin and my sin and every vile sin that everyone who've ever lived would co uh, commit, uh, he had to become that in order to atone for it. Uh, when he became sin, uh, the Father who is holy uh, uh, cannot... Uh, except sin uh, and he had to break fellowship with his son and turn his back on him uh, Jesus from the cross uh, cried my God my God why hast thou forsaken me Amen. he gained separation from the Godhead there's not a parent worth their salt that would give their child for some filthy vile sinner in this world but God gave His Son for every filthy, vile sinner in this world. But it cost Him separation from the Father. Isn't it amazing? Putting on flesh didn't cost Him that. What cost Him 
was when he became sin. What did he gain? I find he gained one more thing, Brother Jim. He gained sinners. The Bible said he came seeking to save that which was lost. He came for sinners. He came to atone for sin that he might redeem sinners. He knew there was no way we could go to heaven, Brother Aaron, without his royal redeeming blood being shed for us. The Bible says without the shedding of blood, there's no remission of sins. Uh, the Bible tells us of all the Old Testament sacrifice, all the lambs, all the bulls, all the uh, rams, all the goats, everything that was given in sacrifice to God, uh, uh, those were just a picture. Uh, those were just a foreshadow uh, that one day God would send His perfect lamb. Uh, and John the Baptist seen Him come to the river of Jor Jordan uh, said, Behold the Lamb of God which taketh away the sins of the world. World. Uh, hey, the only one who could redeem us from our sin uh, was the Lord Jesus Himself. Uh, and He made a way uh, where sinners could be saved from their sin. Uh, where our sins, though they be as scarlet, could be white as wool. Uh, hey, where our sins could be cleansed. Uh, hey, what a blessing to know. Uh, for by grace we're saved through faith and not, not of ourselves. Uh, uh, it is the gift of God, not of works, lest any man should boast. Uh, if I could work my way to heaven he wouldn't have had to come uh, but all my works all my deeds are as filthy rags uh, it took him uh, taking my place on the cross of Calvary uh, and taking the handwriting and ordinances of this book uh, that reveals I'm a sinner uh, reveals I'm no good in my flesh uh, reveals I can't go to heaven uh, he took all those ordinances uh, and nailed them to his cross taking them out of the way uh, making a way uh, for every sinner to be saved from their sins. Uh, and just like he came into his own, his own received him not. There are many who don't receive him. But to them who do, they become the sons of God, even to them that believe on his name. He came for sinners. That's, why he gained, that's what he gained. That's why he endured everything that he endured. Hebrews tells us he endured the shame for the joy that was set before him. What joy? How could you find joy in being beaten the way he was uh, and being disgraced the way he was? Uh, he looked ahead and saw you and I that would believe on him uh, and he said, it's worth it. Uh, and he gave his life for you and I. He gained sinners. And I have one other question tonight. What has he gained in his saints? See, that you and I that are believers, we once were sinners, but now we're looked at in the Scriptures as a saint of God. We've been made children. We've been made heirs to the family of God. So my dear friends, now that we were once sinners, but now we're saints, what has He gained from us? He got us. He bought us with a price, His own blood. What has He gained from us? since he got us hmm? you don't acquire something to not get something in return for it what did he get for, for us can I say he deserves something from his saints he deserves an undying love because he showed his love when he died for us we ought to love him because he first loved us I'm going to give you a plug nickel for somebody that says they're saved, a child of God going to heaven, and they don't love God, and they don't love the things of God. You ought to have an undying love for Him. Mm. Uh. Oh, I love Him. I love that old Him. Oh, how I love Jesus. You ought to have an undying love. He ought to gain that from us. He's, he's earned that. Can I say this? He deserves an undivided loyalty. Got to put him above all others and all things. An undivided loyalty. He deserves that. You see, all he had to do, uh, he could have called 10,000 angels to come get him off the cross. He didn't even do that. He needed to do that. He could have just said, uh, I'm coming down and came down. I mean, he that spoke the world in existence certainly could have told them rusty nails, leave my hand. If he'd have came down, There'd been no hope for us. 
He was loyal to the end for you and I. He prayed in his last prayer to the Father before he went to Calvary, not my will, but thy will be done. When was the last time we prayed that to him? He deserves an undivided loyalty, an undying love. But he also deserves an unmeasurable lot. We are given lots in our lives, things that God has planned for us, a lot that befalls us. few of you are pretty, the rest of us are ugly. That's the lot that we have. Few, few of you are slim and healthy, the rest of us, never mind. But he's given us a lot in our life. Every one of our lives is a temple of the Holy Ghost, but it's also uh, a region for God to get, have gains. We're all fields that he sowed in. What is he reaping from our fields? He ought to be reaping, he ought to find in our lot submission. You know, all that he really ever asked from us was to trust him and obey him. That's it. You know, people say the Christian life is hard. No, it's the best life, friend. The Bible says the ways of a transgressor is hard. Uh, Christian not only has the best life while we're awake when we go to bed we can go to bed with peace in our heart I mean we have the fruits of the spirit love, joy, goodness, gentleness meekness, temperance all the things the world's looking to find we have in Christ he deserves submission that ought to come from our life we just obey him he does all things well. He never asks anything too hard from us. He never asks anything unbearable from us. He just asks us to love him and obey him. And when you get in the Bible and start learning the Christian life, it's a, you find it's an easy life. Can I say, he not only deserves our submission, he deserves our sowing. We ought to be, you know, we were beggars that found the bread. We ought to be telling other beggars where they can get the bread. Now, the devil will intimidate you and say, well, you don't know as much about the Bible as the pastor. Well, who knows? But what you do know is what Jesus done for you. And that's all he ever asks us is tell others what he's done for us. Tell them what garbage dump they found you in. Hmm? Say, well, I was raised in church, not in church people, and I realized I was lost and got saved. Yeah, but you still had a stench about you called sin. And God came to where you was and let you know you was a sinner, but let you know he'd save you from your sins. And that day you called upon him, you know what he did? He saved you. And you can tell somebody about that. He deserves that. He deserves our service. Hmm. Miss Nett's been there 33 years, and they recently gave her an award. told her to pick out something out of this catalog for all her years of service. And by the way, her office would have been closed years ago without her. When they found out we had a grandbaby on the way, they about died because she's always said, we get a grandbaby, I'm leaving, I'm retiring. They said, you can have anything you want, just don't leave. She said, I'll give you two days a week. But every week that goes on, it's getting shorter and shorter, huh? Uh, the truth of the matter is, she's been there a long time, been a dedicated employee. She's called off in 33 years, Brother Mike, one time. And that's because the office manager made her mad. It wasn't because she's sick. She's worked sick. Called off one time. Well, they... They told her she can have his catalog, and she picks out what looked to be like a, a lovely necklace and looked it up and what it was worth. And then it came in the mail today. It looked like something you get at the carnival with, you know, where you can't lose. You know what I'm saying? <laughs> she said, oh, what a blessing, huh? I wonder if they'll take it back. Huh? You see, our Lord's not that way. 
See, the Bible says our labor of the Lord is not in vain. And he said that our rewards are gold, silver, and precious stones. Neighbor, you'll never regret your service for the Lord. And there is a payday coming. Can I say this? We're to lay up treasures on the other side. But if I can be real honest before you, when you serve him faithfully, he blesses you so much in this life. You don't even care about what's over on the other side. Are you listening? But he deserves our service. Can I say, for those that serve in the military, they did not have a, an opinion on how much or how little they would serve. When they went to basic training, they found out real quick how much they was going to serve and how little their opinion mattered. Can I say, it's amazing. People will serve their jobs. They'll serve their, their ball teams. They'll serve their uh, schools. They'll serve uh, 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 everything in this world with everything they got and then give God the leftovers. Listen, if you're blessed to have a job, you ought to give an honest day's labors for your boss. You ought to work hard. You ought to not be a sorry, no good employee. Can I say, if you play ball, you ought to give it all you got. Can I say, if uh, uh, you're involved in anything in this world, you ought to be the best one on the team or on the, in the position. But can I say, never get God the leftovers. He deserves your first fruits. You ought to give your very best to Him because He gave His best for us. And can I say this? He deserves an unmeasurable lot. He deserves to reap our seeking. I wonder how much we really seek after God. He says, seek and you shall find. He says, draw nigh to God, he'll draw nigh to you. How much do we really seek after God? It's amazing. If somebody on CNN or Fox News says it, we believe it. But if God says it in the Bible, we, we doubt it. It's amazing that whoever sits in the White House... Uh, uh, announces something, uh, we'll jump to do it. But God says something, we procrastinate about it. Hmm. You see where I'm going? Well, how much do we really seek Him? I was thinking today as I was mowing my yard, how much people believe that God's big enough to take them to heaven when they die, but they really don't believe He's a big enough God to take care of them while they live. So many people doubt everything that he's doing in their life. Oh, but I'm saved. I'm going to heaven. Well, why are you doubting so much now? Hmm. It amazes me how little faith there really is in this world. And how much, you know, faith is dw just dwindling among believers. And it's all attached to the fact we don't seek after God. So then faith cometh by hearing, hearing by the word of God. Do you know where you find him? When you start seeking him here. How much do we really seek him? He deserves that. Uh, he deserves that song Miss Brandy sings, we ought to be like a heart panting after the water brook. He deserves that out of our lives. I've seen all that he gained. I wonder how much he's gaining from us. God help us to look at what he did for us that we might produce all that we can for him. Our love, our loyalty, our lot ought to ooze. Jesus Christ is the best thing that ever happened to me. God help us if he gains less than our best. Let's all stand. Brother Clint, come get a song of invitation. Uh, he's picking out a song. If God spoke to your heart, we invite you to come. If you're here tonight, you don't know him as Savior. He did all those things that you might be redeemed from your sin. If you'll come, we'll get somebody to take a Bible and show you how to be saved. You can be saved tonight from your sin. How long has it been since you told him how much you loved him? How long has it been since you showed him how much you loved him? Folks are coming. The altars are filling up. Brother Clint's picking out a song. Let's have a word of prayer. Father, we bless you. Thank you for the scriptures. Thank you, Lord, for leaving the splendors of glory to suffer all that you went through 
that, Lord, we might have life and have it more abundantly. Lord, thank you for the day you saved me. Thank you, Lord, for being so good in my life. Lord, you have been faithful and true. Lord, you certainly uh, are not reaping near as much as what you've sowed in my life, and for that I'm ashamed. Help me, Lord, to serve you and live for you to the best of my ability. Now, Father, bless this invitation. These folks in the altar, whatever they're here for, God bless them and help them. Speak to hearts now during this invitation. And God will not fail to praise you for what you do, for it's in Jesus' wonderful name we pray. Did you know that IBC is now on iTunes, TuneIn, SoundCloud, and Google Play? Head on over to your podcast provider and subscribe today. And as always, thanks for listening.